Hello, I'm Stephen Mintz, and welcome to the America's Identity, Culture, and Power. Today we're going to talk about the Black Americas, and to help us do this, we're very fortunate to have a guest, Professor Richard Blackett. He's the John and Rebecca Moores Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's also one of the country's leading authorities on anti-slavery, uh, and not just for this country. He was born in Trinidad. He was educated at the University of Manchester in England. He taught at Indiana University and the University of Pittsburgh, and we're very fortunate to have such a specialist here. And what I thought we might do to begin today is for me to ask him a couple of questions before we go into the kind of meat of our subject. And the first question I thought I'd ask you, Richard, is this. Often, the black experience is treated as a marginal or even peripheral part of the history of the United States or the history of the Americas. That is, it's relegated to special classes in Southern history or African American studies. How would you answer that? By saying it's true that it is. Uh, but I think increasingly uh, attempts are being made to integrate it into part of the, the general courses that are being offered. So in that sense, I think there's progress. But there's still a great deal of conflict as to where it fits into the overall pattern of uh, the history of the Americas. But that's not, a, that's not a phenomenon that exists outside of the United States, you know. In some, parts of the, in some parts of the Americas, it is an integral part of the history. So you can't teach the, the history of the Caribbean without teaching the history of the black experience. Uh, so in that sense, it's integrated in some parts. In other parts, it is not. Uh, and, but that's, that's work that is being done. And I think it's reflected in textbooks and things I have received. There's no subject more controversial in the United States today than race. Uh, there are all kinds of efforts to evade this reality, but the fact remains that race remains, as W.E.B. Du Bois said at the beginning of the century, the color line is the fundamental issue. 20th century, it was at the beginning when he wrote those words, and it is at the end, mm -hmm. as we come to the end of the century. But what race means is a subject of great debate, and so I thought I'd read you a couple sentences by an American historian and see your reaction to them. Uh, this was a famous historian at the University of California, Berkeley, named Kenneth Stamp, and he wrote these words. Innately, Negroes are, after all, only white men with black skins, nothing more, nothing less. What would you say to this comment? That's one of those famous quotes that taken by themselves creates a lot of problems. Uh, but in the context of the book, in the time in which it was written, uh, Stamp's study of slavery, I think it's fair to say, changed his peculiar institution, changed the way we have come to look at slavery. So in that sense, then, the as part of a larger study, I have no problem with the comments. But I think the comment standing on its own is simply, uh, is simply incorrect because uh, it does not take into consideration all the issues of culture, uh, of, of African retentions or survivals of, of relationships between people of African descent in Europe within the Americas, all of those things. But Stamp was not interested in culture. So we, if, we, if we're going to be fair to all Stamp, we have to take that into consideration. But the book in itself, I think, uh, has stood up remarkably well uh, in the last 50 years. So uh, I, I think the quotation by itself is, is a problem. Uh, part of a larger study, I think one can see what he was trying to say, although I, I, I totally disagree with it. Okay. Biologically, uh, race appears to be only skin deep. That is, what we mean by, by race in kind of normal parlance means skin color, hair texture, shapes of various features of the body, uh, eyes or, or nose or the like. Uh, and yet, as you're suggesting, there are profound historical experiences that shape our cultures and our uh, ways of, of approaching the world. Uh, and, our, and our definitions of race. And our definitions of race. Yes. So for some, I mean, for one society, race, race may involve certain sorts of characteristics which may not apply in other societies. So as, uh, as the more modern folks would say, it, 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 it may be correct to say it is socially constructed. <laughs> 
uh, and politically constructed. Uh, but those defi definitions have changed over time. But it still remains the salient and, and the, most, uh, the, the most problematic question that societies like in the, in the Americas have had to face and continue to face. Well, what I'm going to do next is spend the next few minutes, the first half of our class, talking about how race in the Americas was socially, culturally, politically constructed, and why. And then we're going to have a conversation in the second half of our class, Professor Blackett and myself, talking about race in the Americas. And you'll be, of course, invited to join in and add in your own comments and questions. So if we could have the overhead projector, uh, the computer screen, please. Thank you. More than 10 million African slaves, probably between 10 and 15 million Africans, were transported to work on plantations and mines in the New World. And today, their descendants number about 95 million people. Now, we in the United States often tend to be quite provincial, and we often fail to realize that that population is not just in the United States, but is, in fact, spread across the entire Americas. In fact, uh, I think it would come as a surprise to most people in the United States to learn that the Afro-African-American population in this country is actually the second largest in the Americas. It's smaller than that found in Brazil. Uh, but again, it is extremely hard to measure racial percentages in the population. What I've done here is to take some figures from the United Nations, and what you discover is that the range of figures that they report on people of African heritage vary incredibly broadly. Uh, again, I guess suggesting the extent to which race is a social, cultural, and historical construct. In Brazil, anywhere from 6 to 33 percent of the population will acknowledge or, or claim to have African heritage. In the United States, the figure is about 12 percent. In Colombia, between 14 and 21 percent. In Haiti, 94 to 100 percent. In Cuba, you get figures anywhere from 34 to 62 percent. In the Dominican Republic, the figure is even wider than that, as uh, striking as could be, anywhere between 11 and 84 percent of the population is of African descent. In Mexico, the figure is incredibly small uh, and raises many questions of 0.5 percent. What makes that particularly incredible is we know that in the 17th century, about a third of the population of Mexico City was African in descent, and Canada about 1 percent. Uh, what is also, I think, quite striking about the Afro-American population of the New World is that it is very large even compared to populations in Africa itself. That is, the African-American population, the U.S. black population, and the Afro-Brazilian population are both larger than any ethnic groups in Africa today. Now, here I have some charts which illustrate the tremendous gap when people try to measure who is black and who isn't. The argument that I want to present to you right now is that blacks played an absolutely indispensable role in the settlement, development, and history of the New World that far from being a peripheral or marginal aspect of the New World experience, blacks were at the very centerpiece of the New World experience. Indeed, I'm going to go a little further than that. I'm going to argue today that it would have been impossible to settle and develop the New World in the absence of 
Africans uh, and their descendants. And so, again, what I'm going to try to suggest to you now is that the black experience is so intimately intertwined with the whole meaning of what we mean by America that there would have been no America in the way we understand it without the black experience. And let me give you two illustrations, uh, a little bit out of chronological context, that might suggest how important the black experience was. In 1663, the Netherlands was faced with a decision. It could make a choice at the end of one of the recurrent European wars. It could have New York, both the city and what's now the state, or it could have Suriname. And Holland chose Suriname. Uh, it chose Suriname because it was convinced that that was a much wealthier area with much more economic potential than New York. And in 1763, a hundred years later, England was faced with a choice. It could either have Canada from France at the end of the Seven Years' War, you'll remember from your high school history courses, or it could have two islands, Martinique and Guadeloupe. There was a tremendous protracted debate in England. It went on for more than two years before England decided to take Canada. Uh, it was a fateful decision for the future. Uh, some would wonder if they made the wrong decision because it would help precipitate the American Revolution <coughs> later. But it's quite striking that intelligent, educated people were convinced that islands that were fueled by slave labor could be more valuable than all of Canada put together. From the very first moment of New World colonization, blacks played an absolutely critical role. Uh, the armies that would win independence from Spain in the early 19th century were mainly made up of black troops. The first major black revolt took place as early as 1514. That's only 22 years after Columbus had, quote unquote, discovered the New World. And there would be frequent insurrections over the next 300 years. We'll see that blacks always resisted slavery, often forming communities known as maroon communities, some of which would have tens of thousands of inhabitants and last for more than a century. All of you have probably heard of the Seminole Indians who lived in Florida, some still do even today, and that too was a sort of, of maroon colony where African American slaves fled and intermarried with the Indian population to form a wholly new people, the Seminole. Now, uh, one of the difficult issues we're going to be dealing with today has to do with the very different systems of race that emerge in Latin America and in the United States. One of my teachers once put it this way. He said, contrary to appearances, Americans are colorblind. It's Latin Americans, he said, who have color vision. Now, what do you mean by that, Americans are colorblind? Well, he meant it literally. That is, that people in the United States categorize people as either black or white, irrespective of how much racial intermixture, regardless of skin complexion. It's the famous one drop rule. But in Latin America, 
a very different system of racial classification would emerge with many terms to describe various degrees of racial intermixture, not only between black and white, but between black and Indian as well. So you have a much more complicated color coding system in Latin America, something that we're going to talk about later. Even in Haiti, which would be the first all-black republic in the New World after its revolt from France during the 1790s, even there you would get a very complicated color hierarchy. Um, now, we do not know whether there were any Africans on board Columbus's first ship. We simply do not know the answer to that. But we do know for sure that by 1502, that is just 10 years after Columbus arrived in the New World, there were large numbers of Africans in the New World already. Now what's striking about that is that if you take the whole period from 1502 to 1820, more Africans would arrive in the New World than whites, than Europeans. Not just by a little, by about four times the number. Okay. So again, I'm trying to reinforce this thought that from the very beginning, Africans were involved in the colonization process and that there would have been no development of the New World in the absence of Africans and their descendants. Yes, please. Could you repeat that time span you referred to? From 1502 to 1820, that is a period of more than 300 years, many more Africans came to the New World than whites. Perhaps as many as four times as many. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. We tried to keep our class on a human dimension, and I thought I'd tell you the story of a man named Equiano. Equiano. He was born in 1745 in the kingdom of Benin in what's now part of Nigeria. He was the youngest son of a chief in Benin and sometime in 1756 when he was just 11 years old he was kidnapped and sold to European slavers. He would later write his autobiography, and these are some of the words in which he described his capture. I now saw myself deprived of all chances of returning to my native country, and my present situation was filled with horrors of every kind. The stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. The closeness of the place, the heat of the climate, added to the number in the ship being so crowded that each had scarcely had room to turn himself, it almost suffocated us. Uh, today we have museums of the Holocaust, but there was an earlier sort of Holocaust, and voices like Equiano's bring it back to life. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered it a scene of horror almost unimaginable. I expected every hour to share the fate of my companions, some of whom were almost daily brought upon the deck at the point of death, and I began to hope that death would soon put an end to my miseries. Equiano would be shipped to Barbados. He was sold at auction. His name was taken from him. He was given a new name, Gustavus Vasa. But eventually, he somehow was able to earn enough money to purchase his own freedom. He would sail the world with the British Navy, and later he would become 
a leader in the British anti-slavery movement. That's when he would publish his autobiography, when he gives us a gripping first-hand account of what it was like to be a slave. In 1789, the year of the French Revolution, he published his memoirs. It gives a vivid account of the horrors of human bondage, which, as I will try to argue with you, is what built the New World. Slavery is absolutely fundamental to the history of the Americas. And this is very contrary to what I think most people in the New World generally assume. Slavery began earlier, it lasted longer, and played a more crucial role in the shaping of modern society than most Americans have realized or admitted. But it also left a lasting imprint it also left a burden of racial prejudice and discrimination, which has by no means evaporated as the 20th century comes to a close. Now, what is slavery? Uh, it's not easy to define, uh, but I would emphasize certain characteristics first characteristic I would emphasize is that it's a labor system under which people can be bought, sold, and exploited as if they were domestic animals. So the absolute central feature of slavery, I would argue, is that people are transformed into a version of property. Now, usually slaves are likened to, quote unquote, chattel property. Chattel are domestic livestock. So slaves can be bought, they can be sold, they can be leased, they can be rented, and they can be beaten. But also, slavery is something psychological. That is, in societies, slavery represents the most extreme form of social and cultural degradation that societies can come up with. And one way that this, I think, becomes evident to us is the way that slave masters always try to, quote unquote, animalize their slaves. That is, they refer to them as if they were animals. When they keep records in their books, they keep the records of the slaves as if they were animals. I will argue today that just as the essence of sexism is to treat women as if they are fundamentally different from men and that they're defined essentially by sexuality, and emotionality, that the essence of racism is to view people as animals. And we're all familiar with how that still goes on today. Uh, the most vivid illustration of that, I think, takes place in sports in American society, where you often don't stress uh, athletes' intelligence. You don't stress the planning. You don't stress the amount of preparation that athletes go through. Instead, you talk about them as if they were sort of gifted, as an animal is gifted in a certain sport. And so I think racism is truly a legacy of this slavery experience, that it grows directly out of it in a crucial way. But we'll talk about this later in our class. Now, one mistake that people sometimes make is to assume that slavery is somehow a relatively recent development, that somehow slavery was a product of capitalism, 
or slavery was somehow a product of Western culture. But in fact, slavery is one of humanity's oldest and regrettably most universal institutions. All of us in this room or out on TV, I'm afraid, are both the descendants of slaveholders and also the descendants of slaves, that virtually every people at some point in human history were both slaveholders and slaves. So slavery could be found in ancient Greece, it could be found in ancient Rome, it could be found in biblical Palestine, it could be found in ancient India, it could be found in ancient China, it could be found in Korea, it could be found in Africa, it could be found in the New World. That is, slavery was an extremely widespread institution. There was nothing unique about New World slavery in didn't that some, sense. Didn't some groups of Indians also have practice slavery? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little, a little bit. Uh, so again, slavery appears to have originated in prehistoric times and could be found in virtually all societies at some point or another. But all that said, modern slavery does differ from slavery in other times and other places. And it differs in four or five respects. The first way that modern slavery differed from slavery in the ancient world or the non-Western world is that it was based on race. Color distinctions did not apparently matter too much to people in the ancient world. So if you saw Roman slaves, they might actually have looked like Kirk Douglas uh, in Spartacus. That is, there were blonde-haired slaves, there were blue-eyed slaves, there were red-haired slaves, there were black slaves, there were Jewish slaves, there were Russian slaves. That was, it was not race that defined slavery. So when did racial slavery emerge? It did not emerge until the 15th century, the 1400s. Racial slavery originated in the Arab world, but was quickly adopted at the same time in the European world. Okay. Up until that time, they had relied heavily on slaves from Russia. Uh, and when that source of white slaves was cut off in the 1500s, there was a shift from white slaves to black slaves. The second major difference between modern slavery and its ancient or third world counterparts was that slavery was permanent and hereditary. Permanent and hereditary. In many societies that practice slavery, many slaves eventually are given their freedom and are incorporated into the society as a whole. Now, no doubt, many slaves are permanent hereditary slaves. But we also know that many slaves are incorporated into the society. So it's not quite the same thing as our system uh, that you would have in the American South or elsewhere in the Americas in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Third difference, in modern societies, Slavery represented the lowest social status imaginable. But in the ancient world and in the non-Western world, you could sometimes have people that were in a lower status than slaves. That is, some free people were actually in a more debased position than slaves. Let me give you an illustration. If you remember the Bible story of Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt, and there he became a trusted administrator of the Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. Uh, there are many stories like that. Clearly, slavery 
did not necessarily mean the lowest status. Let me give you an illustration of this. In the Islamic world, often rulers of society were chosen from among slaves. How could this be? This seems like madness to us. In the non-Western world, the ancient world, the opposite of slavery was not freedom. Slavery meant someone who wasn't part of a kin group. And so a slave came from outside the kin network. So it might make sense to choose a government official from outside the kin group. They wouldn't have any of their own vested interests. Okay. So it's a very different system. Okay, the last most important difference. And that is that only in the modern world did slavery become the engine for a system of capitalistic plantation agriculture. It became the driving force for capitalistic plantation agriculture. Now, slaves had been used for plantation agriculture earlier in time in the Roman Empire, for example. But now you have a system geared to maximum production, and slaves will be the workforce for that. And not just for any kind of agriculture, for a particular kind of agriculture. What is crucial about the discovery of the new world, I'd argue to you, is that the new world crops would become the motor for a new consumer economy. A consumer economy not just aimed at an elite, but at a mass consumer market. Let me just briefly run through some of the crops that they grew in the New World uh, and then ask you a question about them. Okay. They grew chocolate, and they grew coffee, and they grew cotton, and they grew rice, and sugar, and tobacco. And quickly those products would develop a mass consumer demand. Okay. They would be purchased not just by aristocrats, but they would become necessities even for the working class over time. So that even ordinary Englishmen would want sugar with their tea, and the sugar was produced by slave labor. So let's first look at those crops. What do chocolate, coffee, uh, sugar, and tobacco have in common? Draw stimulants. And, okay, would you like to draw a conclusion from this? Uh, one could claim that they're bad for your health. Okay, anyone else like to throw their hat in the rings with this? I mean, what is it about chocolate, coffee, sugar, tobacco that's, that's really striking to us? Yeah, there's an unlimited demand. In a, in a certain sense, they are at least psychologically addictive. They may even be physically addictive. Uh, what's going on here? Care to speculate? The new world is producing new kinds of crops, but there's certain kinds of crops that they specialize in. Kitsio, you want? Uh, well, I was going to say uh, a permanent consumer society. I. Absolutely agree. I mean, something here is going on. It's not just any crops that are growing. Uh, they're crops that give people energy so that they can work harder. They're stimulants so they make people work harder uh, in their own way. And they create needs that force people to work harder so they can earn the money to get more of those goods. It's quite interesting. I mean, we often joke. Uh, it sounds a little bit like a sort of drug traffic in its own way. But it's the engine for the first mass consumer society the world had ever known. And it all depended on slave labor. Uh, to me, one of the most disturbing things about history is to see that a whole 
series of events would have to happen for a certain outcome to occur, and they all did. It would take an infinite conjunction of events for the New World slave system to emerge, and they all happened. That is, the Indians had to be unable to resist the intrusion of the Europeans. The Indians had to be unable to serve as a mass labor force. Uh, you had to have mass depopulation of large areas of the New World. You had to have a large population somewhere else, but located on ocean currents that would easily allow them to be transported to the New World. And you had to discover food crops in the New World that would spur population growth in Africa. All those train of events would have to happen for this slave system to develop, and they all did. And it sort of gives one the creepy feeling of the African god of death, Moloch, uh, creating sugar as a furnace in which African labor was consumed. Somewhere between 10 and 15 million Africans would be brought to the New World. That's arrived in the New World. Another group of around 10 to 15 million Africans would also be transported to Arabia, to India, Iran, Iraq, and North Africa, though over a much longer period of time than the 400 years of the slave trade. So we're talking about one of the pivotal historical events in all history uh, with vast consequences. So we often think of the integration of the global economy, the internationalization of the world as a product of the late 20th century. Here we see it happening nearly 500 years ago. Now, we're talking about a huge period of time. The Spanish conquistadors brought blacks to the New World at least as early as 1502, and slavery was not finally abolished until Brazil in the New World, until Brazil ended it in, 19, in 1888. It wasn't abolished in Saudi Arabia to 1970. Uh, so again, uh, as you can see here, we're talking about a huge number of people and a group that vastly outnumbered the Europeans who came to the New World over that same span of time. So we're talking about <coughs> the largest forced migration in all of recorded history. So we're talking about one of the real horrors of history. Now, slavery is sometimes regarded as a tragic mistake, kind of historical anomaly, a dark cloud, very disturbing, but it's an isolated storm cloud. But my argument today is that slavery was not an accident, it was not an anomaly, and it's not gone. Its legacies are very much still with us. So if we are going to face up to our time, we better sometimes look backwards and see how we got here. Um, my point is that slavery was the engine of economic development during this crucial period from the early 1500s through the early 1800s, that it was a tremendous source of wealth that played a critical role not just in the development of the New World, but in development in Europe as well, something that Professor Blackett and I will converse about a little later. Now, 
The slave trade was the world's first multinational industry. In history textbooks, you read about French navigators and English navigators and Italian navigators and Portuguese navigators and Spanish sailors. But seldom do we see that this is all part of a system. That in the span of just two decades, from about 1480 to 1500, European navigators, backed by the financial capital of Germany and Italy, would master the world's ocean currents and would be able to trade across the entire world. So at just the time that Columbus is sailing to the New World, a sailor named Diaz was sailing around the Horn of Africa all the way to India. I mean, the whole world is suddenly opened up in the space of two decades to European influence. Portuguese and the Spanish provided the political and navigational skills. Italy and Germany provided capital. The Dutch were traders who sold the goods that they produced. So they we're tru truly talking about a multinational enterprise that many countries are engaged in simultaneously. Now, almost from the beginning, the colonizing powers recognized that they needed a labor force to work in the New World. Now, they would experiment with other kinds of labor. There were many experiments with Indian labor. Uh, and later, there were experiments with white indentured servants in uh, the English New World. But in every part of the Americas, from Canada to the tip of Argentina, they would turn again and again to slave labor. There was no part of the New World where there weren't slaves, except for a brief period of time in Georgia, of all places, uh, where temporarily, for a period of about 10 years, slaves were forbidden. Um, and again, almost historical accident helps to account for this. In 1443, the Portuguese had gone around uh, North Africa to establish trading posts along the West African coast that allowed them to uh, trade independently of Islamic traders in Africa and therefore would develop trading ties that later could be used to develop slavery. Uh, slaves would mine precious metals. They would harvest the sugar, indigo, and tobacco that would make colonization worthwhile. So textbooks might call it the golden age of discovery, but it was much more than that. What we really see going on is a massive commercial enterprise, a mass multinational enterprise which slave labor made profitable. So just to underscore my point again, without slavery, the whole enterprise that we call the New World would have been inconceivable. So maybe that's one reason why Leif Erikson's voyage to Vinland uh, made much less difference than Christopher Columbus's voyage 500 years later. Slavery was a vast, highly regimented labor system that subjected Africans and their descendants to deprivation, brutality, and sent them to die by the millions from disease, malnutrition, injury, and abuse. Uh, some of the statistics are almost unbelievable. For example, in the uh, 
gold mining areas of Brazil in the 18th century, the average life expectancy of a slave was two years. The survival rate of a field hand on a Brazilian sugar plantation was about seven years. Um, the average life expectancy of a slave in the American South before the Civil War was between 21 and 22 years. That's life expectancy at birth. That's at a time when the average white's life expectancy is 43 years. Indeed, these death rates are so high that the slave population would decrease in numbers without continued imports from Africa. Indeed, even in the early 19th century, only one slave society could naturally reproduce its numbers, and that was in the United States. In every other slave society, the slave population would decline about 5% every year without continued imports. Why do you think that be? Why in the United States could the slave population reproduce its numbers but not, say, in the West Indies? What do you think? Cheap, cheaper to import them than to treat them properly? I think, I think that's very important. That is, it was so profitable in the West Indies to have slaves that it paid to get purchase new ones, to work slaves literally to death and purchase new slaves precisely because it wasn't as profitable in, the, in colonial America, colonial what would become the United States, it was more important to uh, see that the slaves reproduced their numbers. Uh, again, the figures are almost unbelievable. 600 some odd thousand Africans were imported into Jamaica in the period of about 130 years. 31,000 died simply sitting on the boat waiting to be taken off the boats. That doesn't include the voyage across. Uh, and it doesn't include the high death rates after arrival in the New World. Uh, Europeans were a very tough in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. They had gone through a series of devastating internal conflicts like the Hundred Years' War that we've mentioned in our class, like the Thirty Years' War, religious, deep religious conflicts. They had seen one-third of Europe's population die in the Black Death. These were a emotionally toughened group of people. But even a mercenary, named John Stedman, who uh, went to Suriname to suppress a slave uprising there, was astonished by how openly torture was used against slaves. We have what appear to be authentic accounts of slaves being boiled in oil or thrown into furnaces. Uh, not long ago, said one colonist. I saw a black man hanged alive by the ribs, between which with a knife was first made an incision and then clinched an iron hook with a chain. In this manner he was kept living three days, hanging with head and feet downward and catching with his tongue drops of water. Uh, slave uprisings in Suriname were widespread and eventually they would overthrow uh, the Dutch and eventually slave opposition would help to weaken slavery throughout the Americas. Um, uh, there were spectacular slave insurrections repeatedly 
through the history of the Americas. Uh, the most dramatic occurred in Haiti during the 1790s in the midst of the French Revolution. There was a huge insurrection in Guyana in 1823, another in Jamaica in 1831. That was the same year as the famous Nat Turner insurrection in southern Virginia. Uh, one slaveholder wrote this, how long can they resist the seductive and irresistible call, rise, kill, and be free? Uh, now, slavery, I would argue, has had many lasting legacies on the Americas, that we'll talk about more later. One is racism. A second is a legacy of environmental and economic blight, a pattern of chronic underdevelopment that retarded social progress in many of the areas where slavery was so profitable back in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, so one issue that we're going to have to talk about later in our class is the very peculiar relationship between slavery and economic development. Again, back in 1663, you could conceive of trading all of New York for Suriname. But uh, while uh, I'm sure there are some people who would be happy to make the trade still today, uh, most people would not make it on financial grounds. Even in the American South, I would argue, slavery permanently distorted the economy. In much of the South, the end of slavery was accompanied by the rise of a form of debt peonage that we call sharecropping. So even in the United States, slavery would leave an economic legacy as well as a legacy of racism. What about the slave trade? Most slaves came from the West African coast. Uh, a significant minority also came from Central Africa. About half were taken from Angola and southern Nigeria. Smaller numbers came from what is now Benin, Gambia, Ghana, Mozambique, Senegal, and Sierra Leone. In general, males outnumbered females about two to one. Now, one reason for this is that traditional African slavery valued female slaves more than male slaves, so that, in essence, there was a sort of, quote unquote, surplus of male slaves here. Uh, and as we'll talk about later in our class, there would be many, many cultural legacies from Africa that would persist into the New World. It could be seen in naming patterns, in language, and in many other ways. Uh, some of the words that survived, uh, the African word for Wednesday, Kwako would become Jack, Kujo Monday would become Joe, FIBA Friday would become Phoebe. There could be a sort of uh, interesting cultural hybridization taking place. Now, what did the slave trade mean for Africa? Now, here I'm going to talk about a complicated and very difficult subject, so I'll try to speak as clearly as I can. There is a myth. Uh, popularized by books like Roots, that Europeans generally physically trapped and enslaved Africans. It did happen. It certainly happened. But for the most part, Europeans were located along the coast in trading posts and therefore purchased slaves from African slave traders. So it is true that in the absence of this complicity, the slave trade would have been impossible. But let me not stop there. I teach 
U.S. History Survey course. And there's always somebody in the back row, I like to think someone from a fraternity, who will then raise his hand. And his goal is to ignite race war in my class, not really to ask a question. And the question, therefore, is you know, along the lines of, oh, well, then Africans are responsible for the slave trade, not Europeans. And this is, of course, a gross distortion of the facts. This would be like saying that a cocaine user out in the Houston suburbs, living in an affluent area, has nothing to do with, say, the drug trade in Central America. Well, it's true and it's false, obviously. They have everything to do with it because here we're talking not only about creating demand for slaves, but distorting the entire social systems in West Africa. How so? How could Europeans create a system that would provide them with slaves even if they're not personally entrapping slaves? What could you do? What do you think? Okay, how I mean, how could Europeans create a situation in Africa that would provide them with slaves without having to trap slaves themselves? Provoking local wars? Right. Well, one of the ways would be by providing guns. Because if you're able to find groups that will work with you and you provide them with guns, then this can train the whole political situation in West Africa, and that's precisely what happened. So certain groups that would cooperate with the Europeans, uh, the best example is Ashante, would receive guns from Europeans and then wage wars against neighboring African peoples. Okay. Other African societies like Benin resisted uh, this European efforts. But the Europeans, in sh short, were able to distort the political system in ways that would strengthen those groups who would cooperate with them and weaken those groups who wouldn't. Okay. So what effects did slave trade have on Africa? And it can all be summed up in the title of a book book written by a famous scholar named Walter Rodney, and it's called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And there are certain ways the slave trade experience had long-term effects on African society. It did not depopulate West Africa as a whole. But it did depopulate many specific areas. And much of what we now call, quote unquote, jungle, what we in this class call rainforest, was not rainforest before the slave trade. When those areas were depopulated of people, and it was no longer possible to have settled agriculture, then rainforest could spread through those areas. So depopulation of certain areas was one consequence of the slave trade. It distorted political structures, as I said. Because of European patronage, certain groups that were willing to cooperate, certain merchants that were willing to cooperate, were strengthened. And so it helped create a situation that we sometimes uh, here referred to in newspapers today as warlordism. And probably the worst effect, among, apart from the human toll, uh, is that it undermined local industries in Africa. In 1500, there was no question that European goods were not better in some sort of absolute sense than goods that were produced by Africans themselves. 
steel from Africa was probably of higher quality than steel from Europe at that time. Textiles from Africa were superior in quality to textiles from Africa, excuse me, from Europe. And Europeans are always so proud of their boats. When Portugal tried to invade Angola in the 16th century, African war canoes, notice how the language differentiates between ships and canoes, were able to defeat the Portuguese fleet. So we're not talking about one area superior to the other. At first, at least, there's a lot of equality. But the Europeans made it clear that they would sell goods, but they would only purchase one good, and that was human beings. Okay, so the slave trade will inhibit economic development in West Africa. Now, how could all this have happened? Uh, why is it that Europeans failed in their efforts to take over India, at least in this period, uh, failed in their efforts to uh, make strides into Japan or China uh, during this period. And the answer is that sub-Saharan Africa was fragmented politically. There had been strong states earlier in time that we talked about in our very first class, like Mali, and Ghana, but they had declined by the 16th century. And this political fragmentation gave Europeans many opportunities. Further, you had developed agriculture in West Africa. People were already familiar with various forms of servitude, though nothing like the new kind of servitude that the Europeans would develop. Now, what I'd like to talk about next is racism, because this is the most lasting legacy to grow out of the slavery experience. And exactly what the relationship is between slavery and racism is extremely complex and something that Professor Black and I will talk about later. Uh, it is a sort of chicken and egg problem, but it's absolutely essential to understand that racism served to help legitimate slavery. Okay. So slavery played an absolutely critical role in the development of modern racism. Even before Africans arrived in the New World, Europeans had already developed a series of negative stereotypes. Uh, earlier in time, Africa had been associated as a place of great wealth in European folklore and painting. But by the 16th century, you begin to get much more negative depictions of Africa in European culture as a land of cannibalism, of pagan ritual, as what Europeans regarded as the antithesis of their civilized society. And there may have been even deeper roots for European racism. That is, the color black had deep symbolic meaning. In India, the color white is the color of death, but in Europe, black is associated with death, evil, and filth. Now, originally, when Europeans justified enslaving Africans, they did it not on the basis of skin color, but rather on the basis of religion. After all, the Europeans had been engaged in a 500-year-long war with Islam, and they associated Africans with Islam and with heathen or pagan faiths, quote unquote. They distinguished between Indians in the New World and Africans in that 
in their in European eyes, the Indians were wholly innocent. They had never been exposed to the Christian gospel. And therefore, they couldn't, couldn't be held against them that they hadn't converted. But the argument was made that since Africans would have known about Christianity, they had turned away from what Europeans regarded as the true faith. And then in the 16th century and 17th century, a distinctly racial rationale for slavery emerged. And here I'm just going to digress for one brief instant to talk about how modern racism emerged. Because it arose in a kind of peculiar way. It involved the Spanish treatment of Jews. As you may know, the year 1492 would have been a very important year even if Columbus had not discovered America. Because it was in 1492 that Europeans finally succeeded in expelling all of Islam from what is now present-day Europe. The Moors, North African Muslims, were expelled from Spain. They weren't the only people expelled. The other people expelled from Spain that year were the Jews. But Jews were told that they could stay if they converted to Christianity. And many did. But over time, the Spanish became very suspicious of these conversos, or as they were known in Spanish, moranos, which means swine. And over time, these suspicions grew and grew and grew. And the Spanish were very concerned about, quote unquote, purity of blood. And so they decided that the Moranos were not really converts to Christianity. They were secretly practicing Jews. And so religion didn't matter anymore. It was your racial background that mattered. And it was right then that you can be seen the beginning of what would become modern racism, that it's not religion that condemns you. It's not the fact that you're a barbarian or a heathen or a pagan, it's somehow your racial background. And it's during the 16th, 1600s excuse me, that racial justifications for slavery begin to emerge. Um, by the late 18th century, at the very same time that you get the modern ideals of liberty and equality for all, you also get an important loophole. And that loophole was biology. All, quote unquote, men are created equal, but that all depends on your definition. Uh, biologists and ethnologists uh, would argue that the races were created separately and were arranged in a racial hierarchy. And this would serve crucial functions. It would help equalize all whites, regardless of their economic status, by relegating all blacks to a separate and lower status. Yes? Does that fall into the uh, area of craniology? That would happen at exactly the same time. I had had more time, I would have done uh, a little presentation on the ethnography of racism, and hopefully later in our course we'll be able to do that. So as democratic ideas of equality begin to emerge, as old forms of old rationalizations for slavery begin to break down, they come up with a new one, and that has to do with race. And no one better illustrates this than Thomas Jefferson, uh, the apostle of American liberty. Thomas Jefferson believed that slavery violated the fundamental principles of a Republican society, but he also believed that the two races could never coexist on a level of social equality. In his notes on Virginia, Jefferson develops a 
uh, sketches out a vague plan for gradual emancipation and deportation of blacks. He also advances various pseudo-scientific, as he puts it, suspicions of racial inferiority. In other words, the apostle of liberty, who pointed towards a future of democracy and equality, also pointed to the way that could be evaded and various kinds of inequality could be rationalized in the future. The key here is that inequality would not be defined on unnatural grounds like class. Inequality would be justified as natural, rooted in natural distinctions like gender or race. In 1854, a Scotsman would come to the New World. Uh, he visited the United States. He also visited other parts of the Americas. And he would say this in words that are strikingly modern. We see in effect two nations, one white and another black, growing up together within the same political circle but never mingling on a principle of equality and what is so horribly depressing 142 years later is that that vision, two societies, one black, one white, continues to persist even to today. Uh, yet, I would also argue that if there is any redemptive meaning in the history of slavery, it lies in the ideal of freedom. That is what has happened over the past two or three centuries is that we've come to realize that various forms of slavery, some subtle, some less so, obstruct real human fulfillment and equality. Um, I just have a couple more minutes and I want to talk very briefly about the history of sugar. It would have been better for all of humanity, I will argue, not to say our teeth, had sugar never been discovered. Uh, right from the start, Columbus wanted to raise sugar in the New World. After all, his wife was the daughter of a major colonial figure involved in sugar production in the islands off of the African coast. And so when Columbus came to the New World, he brought some stalks of sugar cane. But the Spanish could not be expected to do the back-breaking work of raising sugar, so they forced the Indians to do this. But when the Indians started dying, then they needed a new force of labor and they turn to Africa. And for the next four centuries, Africans would toil to bring Europeans sweets. Sugar cane would prosper all across central parts of the New World, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, but especially in the Caribbean. Uh, at first, the sugar trade was dominated by Spain, then Portugal and the Netherlands, but ultimately it would be dominated by England. Sugar cane is a very, very messy crop to raise. First, you have to clear huge tracts of forested land, and this would then cause drought and erosion, something we'll talk about later in our course. Sugar had to be planted, it had to be harvested, it had to be crushed, boiled, and cured. Uh, one island, Barbados, in the mid-17th century would produce 14 times as much wealth a year as all the New World colonies north of Virginia. 14 times as much wealth. That's how ravenous Europeans were for sugar. Let's take a break.